The presenting sponsor for On Education is Schoology. Schoology is not only the best learning management system, it's also a community of lifelong learners. There's so many things to love about Schoology, but my favorite is the company's passion to connect with their teachers and students to deliver the best product possible. If you want to learn more about Schoology and how they can help you advance what's possible, visit Schoology.com. I'll listen to that voice any day, folks. Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss the implications of posting those amazing pictures of your classroom decor, debate the top challenges facing educators today, talk about Microsoft's announcement that Minecraft Education Edition is coming to the iPad, and our guest this week is friend of the pod, Stephen Rayow, who will be talking about how we all should be practicing digital citizenship. Yes, that includes you, Mr. President. Hot take. Hot take, Glenn (laughs) Irvin. I love that. That was too easy. Too easy. It was right there for you. I actually kind of... We've already recorded the interview. Hey, newsflash. Yes. Uh, uh, And and I kind of insinuate that that we should all be modeling digital citizenship because we all should be modeling digital citizenship. Too many bad Uh, examples of that out there, you know? Yeah, especially right now. Mm-hmm. It's not we're not in the environment. I mean, Twitter's a Twitter's a disaster. Except for our little world of our little world of Twitter is amazing. In fact, yeah, I think and, that yeah that it's really good and really great discussions. I think people get a lot from from being able to go ahead and and have those discussions in a forum like Twitter. Sure. Speaking of Twitter discussions, yes. So this week we had uh, what I'm calling the Instagramming of our classrooms. Uh, Twitter yeah. discussion and it was uh, started by Corey Graham, a uh, friend of the show <laughs> at Corey Tellers on uh, Twitter. If you don't follow her, you should. Um, Hi, she Corey. is an elementary school teacher extraordinaire and uh, she. I think she's also uh, she's like a uh, I wouldn't want to say a, a computer teacher, you know, that because she wouldn't consider herself. It's more like um a maker space, a, a place where you're going to be able to learn about coding and some different things. So she's the innovations teacher. I think that's what they call it. In we're going to have her on sometime soon. We've Absolutely. actually almost had her on a couple times. Yes, and she has uh, awesome topics. And I tagged her, I think, on something that got her going. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, she she uh, started a a series of tweets. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That uh, began basically with saying, if you're going to choose to show us all... uh, I think it started with you, actually, Mike. I actually think it started with me, too. I think it did with you. Yes, it started with you. Because you said... I retweeted uh, something. You quoted a tweet from somebody else in it, and it was a beautiful classroom. It was. Um, And you uh, had said, basically, that, you know, look at this uh, amazing... uh, And it was flexible learning space, right? Uh, flexible seating uh, amazing example of flexible seating which uh, it was yes it was and okay. basically what uh, <laughs> I knew that I would get Corey going because we've had this discussion before uh, um, and what we're trying to say is if you're gonna post these pics to make sure yeah. and this is what she was saying to go ahead and post also how did you pay for it number one or number two, how much time did it take you if you're like really skilled in that area? You know, you, yeah. you're you able to get some pieces of wood and you make your own maker space. Well, how much time and effort does that take to do? Because in the end, a lot of us look at those and go like, gosh, my classroom is is just inadequate compared to these amazing um, yeah. uh, other spaces, you know, where learning is taking place. So what she was asking for is basically people come in and say, hey, you know, let us know not only to show the picture, but say, hey, you know what? It cost this much money. It was out of my own personal money or the school was able to fund this. So I'm super lucky. You know, what? what is it that, that got us uh, to be able to get to this point of being able to post these amazing pictures? So, it's not an unreasonable yeah. ask. It's not like she was asking something that was unreasonable. She's asking for context. And I, I appreciate that. I think that Twitter might not be the place to provide. We literally just talked about Twitter maybe not being the best place for context uh, or at least, you know, nuanced, you know, detail-driven discussion, Sure. Uh, unfortunately. Um, I mean, 240 characters or whatever it is has helped. But, um, but definitely, like, I, I get her point. I totally got her point. And it's funny because there's an article on Edutopia that came up 
just a couple of days later. Yes. And and someone tagged me on Facebook uh, okay. with it. Is that the one and where they're borrowing the techniques from some European country, right? I, I can't remember exactly yes. what it was, but it was about flexible spaces, and someone tagged me on it, and, and I wrote that I, I liked, at least I liked that the Edutopia article had provided some of that context, that information on where things were sourced, where they came from. Yes. I'll tell you, because a lot of teachers are, are, and I have seen some really good examples of people posting their 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 context for these flexible spaces and saying well, I got this piece at a garage sale and I got this piece was given to me and this one was donated and I went to old or to Pier 1 uh during boxing week and got this chair and it yes. cost me like 20 bucks and uh it was a, such a great deal I couldn't pass it up and these kinds of things because I I, I think one of Corey's great points was that especially for new teachers yes. having realistic expectations is super important and you're not going to have at, at least I would be stunned and I mean all the power to you if you do but I would be stunned if you had this like perfectly amazing flexible seating type classroom on your own in the first year of your teaching um, it, it, I, I stand by the idea that this is an aspiration, that this is hashtag teacher goals. I, I love it. I think it's awesome, and I think you should aspire to it. And I really liked Corey's points that um, it'd be nice, at least for even education purposes, that you let teachers know, other teachers know, other people know where you got things from and how much they cost. Yeah, the One thing, though, too, Mike, that I was thinking about, though, as you were just talking there, is if you are a new teacher this shouldn't even be in the realm of things that you should be focused on um uh the i mean i don't know how what the studies say as far as flexible learning space and all those kinds of things if you have if you're if you come into a room and it already has those abilities because your district is amazing and they're already uh, purchasing those kinds of things then all power to you that's fantastic but if mm -hmm. you don't and you just have you know, normal desks and chairs or tables and chairs or whatever it might be, and you end up creating your own workspaces and those kinds of things, you know, make your own kind of flexible learning spaces, you know, as best you possibly can, then that's totally cool. I just was uh, talking to some new teachers today, and they are super overwhelmed just by the prospect of the <laughs> first day of school, yeah. much less the first week of school of like, what do you do as far as setting up, you know, talking about like Harry Wong or setting up those behavioral expectations, uh, setting up those procedures that end up happening that end up setting up your whole school year. Yeah. The last thing I would be doing is spending, number one, spending my own money on some kind of flexible furniture, even if you do get it at a garage, so whatever it might be, even just the focus on that uh, takes away from the focus on like, okay, there's a lot of other things that need to happen first sure. before you're before you're thinking about that space. And I, I actually uh, went onto Instagram just because I wanted to kind of see like yeah. what's out there, yeah. and and a lot of our new teachers that is their space. You know, like we're on Twitter, we're like old school. <laughs> yeah. But their new spaces are like Snapchat and Instagram. They don't even call it Instagram. Uh -huh. um, but they are there and that's their place where they are. That's their social media. And they are going to be looking at those spaces and going like, oh, maybe I should be doing that. It's not that big of a deal, I don't think. But maybe our audience can chime in and let us know, you know, again, I think we got a, she got, you know, 60 different responses on the initial tweet and a whole bunch of other things under those tweets themselves too. And really, I would just say that there's so much money. Uh, we talk about this too, me and you, Mike, that mm -hmm. we don't make enough money. <laughs> you right. Know, a starting teacher in the United States, when they bring home their money, you know, $35,000 a year. Well, no, their take home income day. is probably going to be $24,000 US dollars a year. So, with that money yeah don't go buy sofas please yeah if you even if you spent let's say like someone said well i get everything on sale and i only Dude. spend like four hundred dollars a year well yeah. Corey responded with four hundred dollars is a lot of money you know yeah, some some of us that's like groceries a good chunk of our mortgage you know yeah. uh, uh, a couple car payments or whatever else it might be so uh -huh. yes yeah, so it's important just to go ahead and say uh kind of take a step back and then be able to take a look at it from there too own your class, make it your own, love it, you should, but uh, 
please make sure your 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 program is good and that you're reaching all your kids and that you've mastered the art of teaching yes <laughs> uh and then you know work work on your fundamentals if you're a new teacher for sure uh you know classroom management uh i mean listen if you have flexible seating you better be a master classroom manager that's true too. That's 100%. another part. That's a, actually that's a great point. I didn't even think about that. What They're you're just everywhere. Saying there, <laughs> if you have flexible seating, it could become that much more difficult Chaos. to manage your room, and that's the 100%. reason why. I mean, one of the the reasons why it was you know straight rows, you know desk rows is because it was it's easier to manage. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, a great point there, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Kahoot. Yes. Now, now let you import quizzes from a spreadsheet yes so i i got a notification uh there was a thread from yeah. kahoot um it's a thread of basically like you need to update this feature and the thread honestly was four years old <laughs> so four huh. years ago someone posted hey wouldn't it be good if we could go ahead and import uh, a quiz into kahoot um, mm-hmm. And so that just happened like a, t- a few days ago <laughs> that now mm-hmm. you have the ability to do it. They provide a specific kind of spreadsheet in Excel and then you type in the questions or whatever it might be. Uh, and really, it's it, hopefully being able to go ahead and use some of the stuff that you already have and then being able to import those things. But I was looking at that. And I was like, well, that's great, except that was four years ago. And yeah. some other competitors like quizzes and now the new thing that we brought on, you know, the new GIM kit. Uh, I'll allow you to import uh, things from directly from Quizlet, you know, so you don't even have to uh, to think about what the the responses sure. would actually be to those specific questions. I thought it was weird too because I actually was experimenting with it because I was going to make a video, a tutorial video, and you still have to, you can't just put in a vocab list with responses. Do you know what I mean? So you can't just mm-hmm. go like, uh, here's the the word and here's the definition, and then import that and then let it create it auto create a, a random quiz mm. you still have to put in the the other responses you know the 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 wrong choices so i was like oh i don't know how much time that would actually save but maybe it will right yeah i'm not sure so yes i've I'm been playing sure. around with these things i i still think in the end i i might like i i'm gonna try i'm trying to gamify in other ways i guess yes that that i, I don't do a lot of quizzes so the time spent setting up kahoot or GimKit or like i know i mentioned i was gonna try to use it this year but yeah i i i think i'm gonna i'm gonna skip it um for this year i don't do a lot of quizzes anyways i most of my demonstrations of learning are, are practical you sure. know project like based pro- pro- project yep. based and stuff like that um so just the effort it would take to set all this up is just way more than I'm willing to put in for so so little return. And uh, I'm not a big fan of quizzes in computer science, real elementary computer science, anyways. Yeah, uh, I was surprised that they is. didn't borrow the though the model from from for example GimKit, where you already have something in Quizlet that you've developed. You just want to be able yeah. to export that and then import it into something else. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. there's already a couple steps there. And then, but you can't do that right now. You still have to type stuff into a spreadsheet. So I thought I was like, well, it's not that big of news, I guess. <laughs> but this it is, is for this them, is actually. I, yes. I, I think I think this this superintendent you're talking about. I don't know where this was, but uh, yes. he might be. He must be listening to the podcast. Uh, I I I I would hope so. <laughs> I'm not sure if he is or not. But who we're talking about is uh, this superintendent. He he actually goes by at superintendent underscore uh jordan so he's travis jordan from north dakota there you go hi travis yep and he is and from what i'm reading i'm i'm going down all of his different blog posts and they are phenomenal i mean some people write blog posts you know on a consistent basis and they are okay this guy's take on education is somebody that we really want to have on the show but basically he has this he wrote this post on august 15th and it was called hashtag edu zero and what he was referring to is basically what we talk about all the time is our obsession with standardized tests and then starting off a school year with that kind of stuff with student achievement at the top you know saying hey uh, our goal is student achievement and then everything that we're going to focus on for our in-service days and our training and whatever might be is to make sure that student achievement goes up and he and he said 
you know, the, the thing that is really disturbing is another piece of data, which is that suicide rates uh, in our nation, in the United States, have gone up. They've doubled in the last eight years, which, I mean, that's insane. Kids from age Awful. 15 to 19, uh, the suicide rate has doubled for those kids. And then he even put here that suicide rate for teen boys of that exact same uh, age range, 15 to 19, have increased 30% over just this eight year period. And that's, that's just crazy. I mean, my, you know, our, we have both have kids, both have boys. Uh, my oldest is 11. He's entering this, this age range here. And what yep. he basically said is, you know what? We need to put an end to this by actually uh, making sure that we address the whole child. You know, we really uh, uh, be, uh, get to know who our kids are and put their passions at the forefront and really make sure that we are making a difference in their lives, not just their academic lives, but their lives in general. Because a lot of these, I mean, these kids were obviously not connected or not connected very well, you know, or connected in a negative way. Um, And same thing goes with, uh, you know, I was thinking about school shootings or anything else that's going on, mental illness as far as our students really need to address those topics and put them at the forefront because otherwise everything else doesn't matter yeah no 100 percent. the standard focusing on a set like hardcore quiz or uh test or exam like assessments at the start of the year is, is gross like i don't know i i i don't my instant reaction is that that's just i don't know what other word to use I'm, i realize i'm not using like some serious nuanced word but it's gross yeah. it's like ugh, like i feel just gross thinking about i don't know what other word to use man yeah. but it's awful it's but really it happens awful. a lot you know it happens it's a lot. awful yes. it sounds so terrible to even think about putting a kid through like it's september and yeah we're gonna give you a big test to see what you know it's like screw off like it's seriously it makes me so mad yeah uh, I, I can't i can't handle it especially when you know kids are dying kids are getting shot kids are getting killing themselves and and it's awful it's terrible we're, we're not talking about mental illness we're not talking about families and 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 troubles at home and and you know men like oh man like don't we have way bigger things to worry about than than you know test scores yeah let's absolutely. let's let's focus on education that you know teaches them things but also builds them up and 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 you know supports their well-being and encourages them to to learn and have inquisitive minds and 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 think about their future instead of worrying about what's going on at home uh because their their dad got laid off or their or their mom got laid off or whatever else nonsense is going on at home sure um oh man yeah so one of the things that that he he writes in the article too that just an amazing thing that he Mm -hmm. he says that if you can just come to each school day and i mean this is a great a quote here that just saying to yourself and, and then making it happen that you're going to make a difference then that is enough he says as far as that will raise student achievement that will uh you know have your students passions and their and their talents at the t- forefront of your classrooms you know so you'll yeah. you, you'll include them and you'll be able to connect with them so that student achievement will be a secondary effect of being able to connect with our students and then hopefully being able to address, you know, the, the challenges that they're facing. That that's obviously in the past eight years, if, if suicide rate has doubled, it's it's an epidemic. It's something we need to address. Hundred percent. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about a National Education Association article uh, that just came out. On Education is brought to you by Teacher Gaming. Teacher Gaming Desk is an all-in-one toolkit for any teacher looking to use more games in their classroom. This isn't just playing games in class, we're talking about 40 plus blockbuster games supercharged with 200 plus hours of lesson content and curriculum aligned learning analytics. My current favorite game is called Contraption Maker, which allows the students to create Rube Goldberg type of machines in the game. If you want to learn more about teacher gaming, simply go to teachergaming.com to get started. All right, welcome back to the pod. NEA Today, the uh, National Education Association um, website, um, just released a, an inter- a super interesting article uh, on August 3rd. We're going to put it in the show notes. 
uh, 10 challenges facing public education today. And it's funny, Glenn, we, we've talked about so many of these. That I know. I, I'm looking through them. I, it feels, I, I mean, to blow our horns a little bit, I suppose it, it is a little affirming that, that we, we're kind of uh, on the ball in terms of understanding what's facing educators and challenges that yes. educators are facing. It feels good that we've talked about a lot of these, but I, I want to kind of go kind of off the cuff on these and, and we're going to talk about a couple of them um, but I'm just kind of randomly going to pick them because and sounds good uh, I think some of these are super interesting so uh, one of our very first episodes uh, was uh, uh, well actually our very first public episode was uh, reviewing the Apple Education Conference uh, session yes. that they, they put on um, in Chicago and uh, so one of these was seeing past the hype of new technologies. Such such a good. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's so good. Um, and like the, the, yeah, it's like right on our on our radar. So we just got done talking about Kahoot. Yes. <laughs> hype. You know, making making a big announcement that you can import questions from spreadsheets. Um, there was that article that we talked about a couple weeks ago that Google Education had a giant announcement. Oh yeah, about about Google, the, right? The lockdown. And what was it, what was it about? It was about it was, locking down. Yes. yes, not locking down the ability for students to search the internet. <laughs> right. For an Groundbreaking. answer. For an answer. Yes. Yeah, that's getting on the hype train. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you know, there's so many of these. Uh, I'll tell you, I mean, not to pick a, an old wound, but certainly I think that, you know, part of the smart board fad was hype. Uh, you know, not to, we don't need to get into this again, <laughs> but I absolutely think there are some elements of the hype of smart boards in why they got bought by so many places. I agree. I, I love that they referenced the LA Unified School District. Um, purchase of iPads in 2013. Yes. Way way before Apple was ready to do anything related to this. It, and it wasn't even the failure doesn't even come from uh I don't even blame the iPad at all, Mike. And no, actually, not the device. But, but there's something to I mean read that article carefully. One of the yeah. things that the LA school district decided to do is load the iPad with a bunch of Pearson <laughs> apps and content there's, there's your source there's your well, source that's spot. <laughs> that's number one of, yeah. of a bad move number two they teachers. reference in the article you didn't train your teachers yeah then automatically you you're done for you you actually create more problems with tech and bringing that in if you don't train people then you would solve by bringing it in you know it, it, it will create problems in your classrooms it will not help with student learning and there could be discipline problems along the way if you don't have uh, an ability to be able to just really focus in on the training of your teachers and then not only do a uh, training but make sure it's not one off you know too often we do this one time training and then don't come back throughout the year to make sure that we help our teachers throughout the year to develop lessons that are engaging that uh, you know develop creativity in our students and and right. all of those awesome things that we know that our students can do uh, and they, sometimes they are tech related, but sometimes they're not. You know those those uh, those things. So yeah, the LA school district won one point. What was it? Some billion dollars. One point three billion. Yes. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, isn't that the epitome of hype? Putting putting an iPad in a teacher's hand and going, "This thing is so awesome that you're going to change kids' lives." But we're not going to tell you how to use it. You're, it's just <laughs> it's the power of its presence alone <laughs> is going to blow kids away. Yes. And that's literally, that's almost that's exactly it. what they did. That is what they did. And it failed. Yeah. And there you go. What a lesson. We, yes. I mean, and I'll tell you, that's, um, I started at my school in 2013 and we talked a lot about the LA problem. Okay. Um, because we were, our plan was to go one-to-one. -one. Yes. And uh, I mean, we eventually did, but it it gave us pause. Uh, at least we wanted to see how it all shook out in terms of, uh, you know, the I guess what would you call it the the post mortem on sure. on what happened there. We waited to see that. That the but I'll tell you, folks, the the hype trains are are rolling strong, 
and uh, you know, be aware. Put students first. Put put your think about what you're gonna. Actually, I, I I'm telling you, I had this conversation today. We've had these folks in um, uh, to talk about robotics. I, I helped facilitate and uh, and kind of join in on some some robotics training today. Yeah. And and what I was worried about was like we trained everybody on robotics. We at least wanted to give them exposure. But one of the things I talked to, especially a, a specific language teacher, I said, don't try to shoehorn robotics into your curriculum just because you feel like you have to have robotics in your curriculum. Yeah, that's not that's a horrible thing to do. It's, it's a actually, terrible thing to do. It has to do with all technology, too, Mike. Yep. You don't have yep. to. Tr- if you have, for example, at our school, we have MacBooks. Yep. Uh, our principal just told our new teachers, he just said, you don't some lessons do not require the technology Computers. and actually it'll hinder their ability yeah. to be able to do certain things so yeah. being able to use them at times to make it powerful learning and then being able to put them aside and close them up and then being able to do that is yeah. where the real learning takes place and really having teachers be trained on those things and 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 have their learning facilitated too throughout the year instead of just saying hey uh we're going to give you one hour of training good luck you know or those kinds of of things totally so we're going to do two more of these uh the next one i want to talk about is something again we've talked about this before uh the the header was education funding where's the money money and i mean I, I mean, I'm glad to see that this conversation has slowed down a little bit in the sense that um, some some groups in some states got what they needed, at least enough that they could go back into the classroom and keep working. Sure. Um, but there's but it's still so enough. much more. There's so much work to do over, down there. Um, and and uh, what was seven? Uh, so many stats in this article uh, of issues with. Um, states that are cu- still cutting yes. uh, education instead of fixing it. Um, even now, after, like, it's like walkouts didn't teach them anything. Well, they don't have, like we talked about before, the majority of the funding that comes for our educational budgets come from, sorry, states, from the state. Taxes. Yes, from state taxes. So the federal yeah. government gives us a very low percentage. I want to say it's less than 10%, but someone correct me if I'm wrong. But if you can imagine, less than 10% comes from your federal government. Your state government makes up most of the funding. And then the the crazy one is your local funding. So our property taxes fund our specific schools. But you can imagine, Mike, what if you have a, uh, an a area as far as your school district that the, that the taxes that are for properties aren't actually funding the school enough? You know what I mean? So there's definitely yeah. a, a big difference between, you know, what we would consider to be wealthy neighborhoods and then those that are yeah, poor. And so mm-hmm. you're still taxing them and trying to get money for the schools. But are you going to end up with the same amount of money to be able to fund, you know, these students? And the answer is no. And so it's a big disparity in all the different states. It's crazy how different we are as far as the amount of money that we're spending per pupil. And, and I mean, this goes to the last one, but if you don't, I, and you know, I'll wear my opinions on my sleeve about this, but if you don't think that this is a partisan issue, you're out of your mind. Of course it is. And the, the very last one in this thing is electing better lawmakers. I love it. And, and it's like, listen, if you think, if you, if you live in a blue state and you think your schools are bad, go spend some time in Louisiana please <laughs> yeah or it's crazy or or arkansas right please please go do that and then go back to your school and it's going to look like a, a palace to you L- look at look at their look at their schools and look at their pay i mean that's what you want to go ahead and notice is is how inadequately these these uh, states are paying their teachers they're you know they're on the lowest end and yeah. it's sick and it does make a gigantic difference in how we can go ahead and teach our students. So, I mean, the reality is that that you know, Republican GOP governments think education isn't as important as as blue governments do. It's just it's the the proof is in the money. It's obvious. And so, 
we need to you guys need to get out there and and I, I'm so excited about all of the people that are running in the elections these this this round in 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 2018. Uh, you you're seeing some really cool candidates for the first time. Uh, you know something happened in 16 that really brought out people who are. Um, you know, lots of educators are running for office. Yeah, I know what happened. <laughs> well, I mean, we both do, and and I mean, but but it's 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 you and it's me and it's normal people are running for office because yes. because that's the voices that need to be heard. If if you're going to have a representative government that represents everybody, then you should have everybody represented. And and the reality is, there's you know, it's it's a bunch of old white guys mostly. And and that's not a representative government. And it's and it's and it's like real estate, former real estate and business agents and business owners. Right. There's very few. I don't know. How, I don't want to say normal people, but yeah, like, just blue collar workers or right. educators or whatever it might be, you know, that, not, that are yeah. smart and capable and 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 so so incredibly qualified to, to talk about their experiences and and what they'll be able to do to to help so i mean go out there and elect pro education candidates find out you know your if your candidates in your areas um support education and funding and and go out there and support those there's actually a website that the nea um built called educationvotes.nea.org yeah and if you go there you'll see um NEA recommended candidates and I mean all unions do this so this is I mean it is a it, it is partisan I'll guarantee you that almost every single one of the NEA you know candidates will, will be Democrats <laughs> it shouldn't surprise you it doesn't surprise me um, I would love listen I don't think I would love to see anything more than a a a Republican that that was you know getting closer to the middle and just normal on some of these issues, right? I don't have a problem with fiscal conservatism. I have a problem when you cut taxes that screws kids' educations. Sure, but, exactly. You know, you can be a fiscally conservative person and still be a human being that that believes in education. So, yeah, I think you'll like um, this one, Mike. Before we move on to 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 uh, next segment or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Minnesota, and we have a yeah. lot of Minnesota listeners. We actually have Tim Walls, and he is a former social studies teacher. Perfect. And Yes, exactly and, what and I'm talking about. Exactly. He's a former congressman also, and now he's running for governor. Yes, he so, is. And so that is the perfect rep, what, who we're talking about here. And this not just people that were former educators, though that helps a lot, obviously, for educational issues. But it's, it's basically saying that we're going to put education at the top of the priority list, not yep. rich uh, people and their tax cuts. But education needs to be at the top. And you made a really good point. I think it was one of our first episodes. And it just said, Ed, you, told, you told our audience, education is really expensive, but it's worth it. And that's really what we need to take home. And that's what the message we need to spend, uh, spread to people. Don't be embarrassed by it, you know, that no. it's expensive or that, it's, that, you know, that it, it affects your taxes. It's like, yes, and it should because it's super important. Uh, it. it there's a classic quote in West Wing, education should be incredibly expensive for the government to pay for and absolutely free to everybody to consume it. Love it. And, you know, that if, if that's any any politician that says that, it would have my vote. Um, awesome. So go read that article. We'll put it in the show notes. It's super great. Uh, lots of really great things to think about. There's a bunch of them that we didn't even touch on. Um, that are, are super important. We've talked about them in other podcasts. Uh, when we come back, we are going to talk about Minecraft Education Edition. Giddy up. Woo! On Education is brought to you by Audible. Mike, what have you been reading lately? And I suppose you're, you're kind of like me, where you have quite a few books that you have on your list. I have too many books on my list. I have <laughs> probably about 40 audiobooks on my queue and um, between listening to podcasts and audiobooks uh, I am well stocked um, lots of cool books are on Audible hundreds and thousands of titles and you can get your own audiobook download for free uh, if you go to audibletrial.com slash oneducation that's audibletrial.com 
dot com slash on education and you can get a free audiobook download you should go do that like right now all right friends welcome back uh big news this week big huge news um minecraft education edition coming to ipad i i actually think this is rad and um listen um we knew about this and we haven't told anybody uh, we've, we've known about close this. To the best. Oh my god, <laughs> we've known about this for a month and a half, almost a month, mm-hmm. at least a month. We knew this was happening. Um, we were, we were, um, well, embargoed is the media <laughs> word for it. Um, I had to get permission. No, I, I, I was told not to say anything, so yes. we didn't say anything. We kept it under the lid. Uh, but listen, this is a big deal. I think this is a huge deal. This this um, is a, this is going to be big, I think, just for their overall sales and exposure of Minecraft uh, to oh, many many more students uh, throughout not only the United States and Canada but all over the world because yeah. the iPad before this, if anybody doesn't know what you know why we're making it such a big deal, is Education Edition only ran on the latest I O uh, iOS, so like a for example a MacBook or on Windows 10. And many yeah. of our machines in our uh, school labs, for example, uh, are running still old w- Windows versions. We, yeah. don't ha- we didn't have Windows 10, so, and we weren't going to get it. You know, it, it, Whenever you switch uh, systems like that, it's a big deal at a school level. You know, when, you, when you do it, you just don't click a switch and go, okay, cool, everything's going to be all right. It makes a big difference on how we manage things and, and, and everything else. So many schools were never going to go to that. So that as soon as they saw, oh, it requires Windows 10, oh, too bad, we're yeah. not going to get it. But yeah. now that it's available for an iPad, super huge. And I mean, let's be honest. I mean, most schools aren't one-to-one, but a lot of schools, at least in Ontario, a lot of schools at least have, like, one iPad cart. Yes. uh, That robes. I mean, we've talked about equity between schools and districts. We know all about it. I'm not being elitist, I don't think. I'm saying I think it's a reasonable thing to say that most schools have at least one usually have one cart of iPads. Some schools don't, of course. Yeah, or they but, have a, a lot a, do. like a four or five iPads for, per classroom, you know, which right. would be perfect. That's a great station that you can Amazing. go ahead and now use. Exactly. So now, I mean, you can set this up and you can do uh, your the accessibility now is just going to go through the roof. They're I'm not sure they're ready for this. It's going to be great. I I'm I'm really excited cuz we we actually have Minecraft PE on our iPad sets. Yes. At at school, but it's it's not the same as this. This this is going to let you, you know, load up. You know, if you don't know a lot about Education Edition, you should go check it out. Yes. Cuz it it has lesson plans that you can load in, like you can download worlds. Yes. I'm sure there'll be I, some sort of like I don't know exactly how it works now in terms of inside the client. Can you can you pull can you pull in a world from inside the client, or do you have to download yeah. the world and then load it in? You well, good question. I I believe you have to download the world. Right, uh, that's then, actually and, what I thought too. Yep, and then load it from your thing. So on the iPad, it should be interesting how that actually works. You know so what I mean? So if if like the world, the lesson store, for yes. lack of better words, is loaded into the client, I mean that's. That'd like literally a teacher you, with one a teacher with a couple clicks on their side click, of it click lesson started yeah the Bam. world's up and, and running oh. and there's so many cool worlds uh that are already been created for teachers in every single content area the whole lessons have been there for you right. you can adjust the lessons they're free uh and people have been working on these um since education edition came out and you know basically adjusting the old minecraft edu and then creating their yeah. lessons now in this new education edition I think this is huge, super huge, because it then puts that on uh, access to so many more students, especially in our elementary and middle schools. In the United States, you're more likely to have an iPad uh, if you're an elementary. If you're going to go one to one, you're going to go iPad more than yeah. likely at, at the yeah. elementary and middle school level. Hundred percent. Do you think this? Do you think this moves iPads? Oh, that's like- interesting. Like to schools, yeah. Do you think, does does do you that think, does that do you, sell? I wonder if schools, yeah. Probably not. <laughs> to, to, you don't think that schools go? Hmm. 
I um I don't know. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I think game based learning is still semi controversial as far as on the topic list of, of things that are effective, you know, ways of uh, an effective Not pedagogy. To push people over the top. You know? And and so this is like uh, I don't know if it would be enough to for example get a superintendent excited and going, Yes, you know, when we do <laughs> our next purchase we should go with iPads because this is how we, you know, this will be, uh, you know, we can then run Education Edition or Minecraft Education Edition and I'll, be able to push out lessons. I'll go work for that superintendent any day. Any yeah. any superintendent that's so geeked up about, about <laughs> Minecraft coming to iPads there that goes to out to some. buy iPads, yeah. that's a superintendent I want to work for. <laughs> that's an awesome superintendent. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's funny. Yes. Um, so you wrote here, will there ever be a Minecraft Education Edition that works on Chromebook? Yes. So there, I mean, we talked, remember we talked about, well, it was the iPad uh, episode. Um, we talked about the dominance of Chromebooks in, in education. Sure. In, in the United States, at least, uh, Chromebooks are number one by way, uh, by a lot. So yeah. because they're cheaper, I mean, there's way really cheaper. no, there's no uh, other you know way to say it is they're cheaper so will minecraft ever be able to run on that chrome ios whatever that operating system is if they ever did that mike i think that would be also another huge uh boost uh as far as the sales in, in for licenses of education edition it would be a huge boost i i, I think that there's some issues with it from a technical perspective sure. it's just too hefty um, right because the Chromebook Probably. is not really running much of a operating system. Did you ever play Minecraft back when it was playable in a browser? No. Do you remember those days? I don't think so. No. Yeah. Yeah. So way, that's way it, early. We're so talking would, like beta, like pretty, yeah. way beta, way way back. So they would um, have to basically figure out how back to, to make that it, almost. Yeah, to make it super small to be able to run yeah, on that kind of a system. It. I'm not sure. I don't think it'll ever happen. I there are some weird ways that you can like sideload Minecraft, but it it has to be the Java version, and it has to run off like a USB stick kind of thing. Okay. Uh, you have to like basically build a. I think I think the way to do this is you have to build a US a bootable USB stick that boots that that sideloads into a jailbroken Chromebook. <laughs> Now and, you're then, getting, and then you're getting side all geeky loads, to our audience right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> side loads, uh, side loads Linux. Oh god! And then <laughs> and then loads up Minecraft Java from <laughs> from the USB stick and runs locally on the USB stick. Like that's that's where it runs from. So it's you know it's a. I've seen videos because I looked it up. I almost bought Isaac a Chromebook. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago. And I, I'm telling you, the reason we didn't is because of Minecraft. Yeah, um, I could see you know, that. So maybe that's actually why they won't, because they don't care, because they know I'm just going to go buy the thing that plays Minecraft anyways. Uh, very, very much a possibility, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, this is exciting cool. news, and, and I'm excited to play around with it. I, I haven't played as much with Minecraft Education Edition as I'd like. I, I'll tell you, I've played a lot of Minecraft this summer. Uh, but uh, not on uh, the education side. So, uh, well, I'll, we will... I'll bring you a review of it, Mike, because I we bought it for our uh, we we have uh, yeah, licenses in our district. So, as as I go and train teachers with it, and we start using it in the classroom, I I love for it to be tried out in our district in our elementary Using it on those iPads. Schools. Yeah, so we're gonna try it out, and then I'll Sweet. let you know how it goes. Do it, please, yes. please, please, please. I think it's great. Uh, yeah, so when we come back, uh, we're going to talk to friend of the pod. We've name-dropped him more than a few times in the last, I guess, we're, we're at episode 20. Uh, we've name-dropped him a couple times. We're going to talk to our friend Stephen Rayo. Welcome back, everyone, and we are so pumped to have Steve Rayo as our guest this week. Uh, Steve, can you tell our audience about who you are, what you do, and where you're located? Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Stephen Rayo. I'm out of New Jersey. I'm a computer teacher here in, uh, in a great school district in New Jersey, and I'm also a uh, school G ambassador. That is awesome. That's how we actually, I would say that Steve is a friend of the podcast and also obviously our friend uh, because of our associations with Schoology. Um, 
And one of the things that uh, Mike and I have talked about, actually about you on our previous shows, Steve, is is the awesome keynote that you gave at Schoology Next. Uh, can you tell our audience about it, especially the members? You know, there's a lot of people out there that are Schoology uh, users, but they weren't able to actually go to Schoology Next uh, to be able to see your keynote. Can you tell us about it? And then we can follow up with questions about dig- digital citizenship. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to uh, win Schoology's digital citizenship uh, competition with, by putting my digital citizenship unit up onto public resources. So I was asked to come out to San Diego and give a little keynote about my unit and talk a little bit about digital citizenship. So it really was an amazing feeling to you know, be up there in front of almost 800 people just yes. discussing the importance of digital citizenship. And you were rocking it, by the way. I was, I was super impressed. Uh, Crushed it. Yes, absolutely. And it just, it's a really difficult thing to do, especially like you just said, it's 800 people. It's the big stage. Um, and the topic that you chose and, and, and how you got into, you know, being able to give this keynote has to do with digital citizenship. One of the things that I, uh, that I think is a big focus uh, for you and, and for how when you're speaking about digital citizenship is that, that it's not just a student issue. Uh, so can you tell our audience a little bit more about that? Because I think a lot of the times adults think, okay, it's because kids are there and it's only uh, about the bad things that they may or may not do. Yeah, I mean, with the students, uh, of course, we got to make sure we protect them from, you know, starting young with the whole, but they're always used to, oh, stranger danger, stranger danger, and then cyberbullying. But yes. digital citizenship, it's so much more when we're talking about, you know, selecting the proper images and talking about copyrights. But also, what are we posting on the internet? Is everything we post on the internet, is it really there forever? Like, how do we protect ourselves? And it's not just for students, but also for teachers, adults, any parents out there, anyone that's really using the internet. And it really comes down to if you have digital devices in your classroom, you should feel a responsibility, not just to your students, but to yourself to educate everyone about digital citizenship and practice it. And also praise students for, you know, behaving the right way. Because that's what we sometimes forget. Like, we always say, oh, don't do this, you know, don't talk to strangers, don't post that online. But we also have to praise those students that are, you know, tagging pictures to make sure the copyrights are there and they're, you know, making sure everything is great and they're safe on the internet. I mean, it's a classic educational concept, modeling. Like, we're literally just trying to model proper use of technology in our own lives so that our students can see that use and our, our kids, I mean, I have two kids, and and um, Glenn has kids, and, and we're trying to model our behavior online so that they know how to behave online. It's it's super important that we practice what we preach in this regard, and so many people aren't, right? Yeah, and I know that when I go back to school and I start my, you know, introduction to the year for the 360 kids that I see, you know, I'm definitely going to be speaking to them right off the bat about digital citizenship. You know, start the year with that and not just start the year and say, hey, we're done in a few classes. Continue practicing it throughout. It's not just a, a one and done. It's really your education is ongoing. Absolutely. Funny, we actually, uh, Steve and I were on the on Hangouts just like, when was that, Wednesday, the other yes. day? Yeah, yeah, Like two days ago, Steve and I got on a Hangouts call because I'm redoing my digital citizenship unit and we are doing it at the start of the year so I had to kind of get a handle on what I was doing and you were super helpful with me um, and 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 I, I'm really excited now like I'm pumped to talk about digital citizenship probably for the first time in a couple of years um, and, and I'm gonna do it like you said right at the start of the year let's set the let's set the tone uh, for a good year and what's great with it is like these companies like Schoology they're getting on board like Ivan, you guys all know Ivan. Ivan basically said, like, Schoology wanted to do this. They want to be a part of this community and make sure that everybody is aware of digital citizenship. So, I mean, from Google, Pear Deck, uh, all the different companies out there, they're pushing this to the forefront where they're able to supply us with amazing content to push it to our students to not just be that dry, like, hey, let's talk about digital citizenship. 
let's get our like hands in on it, play some games, you know, actually see about what if scenarios and go from there. We should probably refer people to the actual um, stuff that we've been talking about, this uh, Internet Awesome material uh, from Google and Pear Deck is literally, it's awesome. I don't know how else to say it. It's amazing when you dig into it. Yeah, and especially on the other side, you know, in addition to Pear Deck and, you know, Google with the Internet Awesome, Common Sense Media, they they need a huge shout out. That Those guys have been doing everything forever. They have an amazing game, especially for elementary students, called Digital Passport, which takes them through, you know, how to properly talk through text and what not to say to others, what how to be careful. So, you know, between Common Sense, Google, everyone's really getting in on it. I think the biggest part too, Stephen, is that all of those materials you just mentioned are all free too. And they're they're open source for all of us to use and to be able to apply, you know, like how you embedded them inside of uh, of our learning management system, Schoology. But they they belong to all of us. And, it, and like, the one thing that I think is a good emphasis is that all of us that have devices, so any of us teachers, so even if I was a Spanish teacher, as I, I am, um, and and I have students, it's still my responsibility to teach di- digital citizenship right from the beginning of my class. If we're going to be using, for example, an online forum like Schoology, or we're going to be talking about Flipgrid, and talking about what does that actually look like, what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, and then just making sure that we follow up with that too, because I think a lot of us start strong and then we kind of let it, you know, let it go. Uh, but continuing throughout the year to reinforce those those things that students need to hear from us, and we again, like Mike just said, we need to make sure we're modeling those things. And it's like that commercial, you know, you can't believe everything on the internet, such as that French model. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I love that commercial out there because it really shows, you know, you got to be careful what you're putting on the internet, and you know, it, everything's not what it seems like. Someone behind the screen. I may have no idea what Mike or Glenn look like right now, but you know, <laughs> who knows? I don't know if they're shady characters. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, the other part that I wanted to talk about real quick, uh, Steve, is is how much you actually help uh, our community. You know, our Schoology community, not just the ambassadors, but everybody, uh, by posting tutorial videos. And tell us about like what inspired you to start doing that, to then, uh, you know. Uh, How's your channel been going? I mean, so I have my YouTube channel, which is primarily Schoology videos, tutorial videos. It started out as a way when we were beginning Schoology in the district, I wanted, I didn't want to force teachers into saying, hey, make sure you use Schoology, make sure you do it this way. But I just want to send like little snips of videos, like EdTech Blitz is what I call them. These yes. little EdTech Blitz videos to teachers. So then, then they come to me and they're like, Oh, hey, what's that cool thing, you know, that you're doing? And, you know, having Schoology's public resources and putting everything up there. And I know you're huge with making tutorials. And I feel like as a community, we have a huge network that bounce, you know, ideas off of each other. And there's always something new that we learn about. So, I mean, if anybody wants to check it out, it is called uh, EdTech Blitz. Or you can look up my name, Stephen Rayo, on YouTube. There's probably about like 40 videos on there, but there's always something new that's, you know, coming out. And I feel like just as our community has grown, we've all gotten stronger and we feed off of each other. And that's the best thing with it. Absolutely. We'll put, uh, we'll put Steve's YouTube channel in the show notes, um, for sure. Yes, so, so absolutely. You can look in the show notes if you're curious about, uh, um, all the cool stuff that Steve does with, uh, Schoology in particular. Uh, you can check that out on YouTube. Yeah. So thank you so much, Steve, for coming by and and uh, and uh, our we actually did this interview at Schoology Next, but now we get to do it again and we, and we actually have it recorded. <laughs> we we actually mentioned that last show, Steve. I don't know if you listened to last week's yeah, episode, yeah. But, but we mentioned that we tried to record you, and it sounded great when we were there, but it sounded terrible in the recording. So <laughs> we were we were super happy to. Uh, to get you back and you, you came came on and uh got to talk about all the same stuff again so uh awesome we're, we're super happy about this well thank you for having me you know to everybody out there listening i mean congratulations to you guys on this podcast it's it's amazing and it's giving like a fresher breath air to 
really talk about what's going on in the world of education. Um, so thank you for that and you know, being the two that are in the forefront of it. But uh, if anybody ever wants to talk ed tech, Schoology, you know, digital citizenship, you could always send me a message on Twitter. You know, come say hi. Let me know. Awesome. Thanks so much, Stephen, for joining us. Thanks, Steve. All right. Have a great one. On Education is an on podcast media production. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. You can get in touch with us or ask us questions to answer on air by visiting our website, oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. Our sound engineer is Jake Codeweiss. He's on Twitter at JK Radio. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be honored if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon.